Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. If I may ask that we settle down for the second panel discussion of the uh, festival. Uh, firstly, those Charlie's Bakery cakes to celebrate the birthday were absolutely amazing. So whoever came up with that idea, fantastic design thinking solution, well done. And uh, happy birthday once again to the association. Uh, at this Con Festival, we have 39 countries represented in the delegates that we have both online as well as in person. As indicated, we have 50 speakers coming from 18 different countries, seven of which are from here on the African continent. It then begs the question, how do we even begin to tackle the question of design thinking led solutions in a cross-cultural context? And these incredibly brave individuals are here to deliberate on that topic. We have Mana Taheri, who is a design thinking educator, researcher, and illustrator. Hoda Mustafa, who is with the American University in Cairo. Uh, Felix Ofori Dati is the president of the Pan-African Design Institute. John Lamb is a design strategist. And joining us remotely from Latin America is Lillian Sanada, who is with IBM uh, Brazil. And what we are hoping to do in the next 60 minutes is really get to appreciate the need, um, I suppose, for all of us to acknowledge one, there is diversity, and how can we work with that to our strengths? How do we overcome ethnocentrism uh, is one of the questions that we'll be reflecting on. Um, I'll obviously be asking each of the panelists to reflect on their individual experiences uh, in design thinking in their regional, cultural, uh, and social context. And then we'll be looking at specific cultural traditions uh, of creative problem solving and innovation. Quite a bit to cover. As always, you are most welcome to be part of the conversation. Uh, if you are in the wonderful school uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, we'll bring a microphone to you. If you're joining us via uh, the online platform or sitting in one of the overflow rooms, you're most welcome to use the app in order to communicate with us. Felix, I think I'll start with you. Um, mm -hmm. Why is it important for us to establish a need uh, to appreciate diversity and overcome ethnocentrism, do you think? Good, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your question. I would like to start my question by um, putting design in Africa into a contest, um, contest, yeah. Before colonization, design used to be here. But when colonization well, when they came, kind of um, design was, you know, classified under art and craft. And that kind of sort of killed our development. Post-colonization, right. Let me show you an example of something that they did. I think it's already there, right? This is called Edinburgh symbol, very famous in Ghana and along the West Africa, I think even within the West African area. That is a, a design work, but somehow it's been classified as an art and craft thing. These symbols speak a lot. One symbol can say a whole sentence. And these symbols were de developed by a king who realized that his people could not articulate very well. People they, you know, were not educated, so how do I bring them together? How do I communicate with them? And he came up with that. Moving forward, when you look at our blacksmiths, when they are developing their works, they go, talk to the end user, interact with them, and come back, and they'll be hitting the metal, developing it to a point. Go back, test it, and so on. Somehow, it's design thinking, right? But we push it under craft. It wasn't recognized. Moving forward, let me even talk about my personal you know, life in a way, then I'll move it to where we want to go. I did a course at university, and the course was called Rural Arts and Industry. Later on, I found that the course is actually a product design course. But see how they've titled it Rural Arts. 
push it back. Only a few people, I must say only a brave people, we want to do it. Because otherwise you'll be classified as rural. Oh, come on. When people are doing design, that you are going to do rats. But it's a product design, you know, thing. Moving on. Because our design knowledge was pushed back, it got to a point where our understanding of design is becoming a bit challenging. We see design to be a European thing, right? How do you then, you know, talk to the people and tell them about design thinking and all those things? Already they are, they are perceiving it as a, as a Western thing. Again, I'm, 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 I'm touching on points, but I'll bring them all together. When you look at our industry, when you go beyond South Africa, South Africa, you are okay. When you go beyond South Africa, understanding of design varies. They don't even appreciate design. Much more to talk about design thinking. Again, most of the industries over there are informal. Just one person. He's got money. He set up a business. No R&D department. How do you talk to the person about research, design, and go through all design thinking and all those things? Already, his, his understanding of design is different. Some, you know, um, understand design from where I'm coming, Ghana. When you talk about design, really we think about graphic design or the architecture. Uh, quite often it's a graphic design. So you go to this person and you tell him, look, I can develop that, that where are you from, design background. Oh, you are coming to color my things. I already got a colors. You come to do this. No, you see where it's coming from. So what we have to do for me is to, we need to go back a bit. Let's go beyond the campuses. Let's go beyond the city boundaries and in, in, yeah, interact with the people in the rural area. Try to bring the design in the light forward. Let me give an example of an university in Ghana. They were trying to teach the people about design thinking. And the lecturer, I don't know whether he's here or not, I'm told uh, somebody's from that university here. He was finding it difficult to teach the design thinking. So what, I'll go vividly. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, how he went through. He said, imagine there are two or two of you who are interested in your child, boy and a girl, interested in each other. The boy wants to propose to the lady, right? The boy, first and foremost, went to social media, right? To learn a bit more about the lady. That's research, right? Gathering information. <laughs> he came back, right? Now, he analyzed everything. So when I'm going to meet the, uh, the lady, how do I put th things in place? She's interested in that, she's interested in that, she's interested in that. So let me find how I could put a nice package together, right? First date, maybe it didn't go very well. He went back again, went, talked to the, the lady's friends, gathered more information. Went back again, second date. So you see how he, the, 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 the lecturer was able to teach the students for them to understand design thinking. And this was also within the cultural context of how the people you know, behave. So what I'm trying to say is, it's a very fantastic thing we're doing, but we need to also consider the cultural context of the people that we are working with. Otherwise, we'll be talking and nothing will be happening. And design in Africa, we need design. We had design. Unfortunately, like I said, we push it, we push it into art and craft area there. Now, with my organization, Pan-African Design Institute, Pan-African, no political uh, affiliation. It's just a name, please. <laughs> so, well, I've had um, some problems with Americans when you talk about Pan-African, they think you are from political background and other things. No. We're just an association of um, design educators and professionals and advocates all over Africa. We come together and we see how best we can educate the ordinary people about design. First and foremost, we need them to appreciate what design is before we could talk about the other things. For them to understand what design is. So going on, yeah, we have to find ways and means of trying to let the people understand design thinking and so on, using their local you know, content. 
how they understand things before we can move on to other things. Otherwise, we'll not be I going think, I think that resonates with a lot of people, Felix, and I think a lot yeah. of people will, will, will sit with that and go, any essential, well, an essential part of any design thinking policy approach framework is connecting and showing empathy, right? Yeah. In order for you to understand. And I like the idea that we must take it out of the urban settings, out of the, as the professor uh, related to it earlier, the conservative setting of a university and actually really start getting yeah. engaging with people. And I imagine, Hoda, that's something you would, you would resonate with, right? That, that a, a lot of that you agree with. Yeah, I'm going to sort of frame this from a uh, perspective of that the Middle East and Egypt in particular, because I'm from Egypt. Uh, I don't sound like I'm from Egypt, but I am from Egypt. Uh, <laughs> is, a, is, is ready, right? It's a fertile ground for bringing uh, the design thinking mindset, the, if you want to call it a process, the values into our culture. Because of my personal understanding of what it is to be Egyptian. And um, I think we do face a lot of um, issues and challenges, but there are already pockets where design thinking is happening, but it's not called design thinking, right? So we don't use the word. Even the word, tafkir tasmimi in Arabic, is, is a very analytical, it has a very analytical root. And until very recently, and I know our colleague Kennedy is doing a lot of research in HPI about the use of Arabic language, there are no Arabic translations for many of the um, terms that we use in design thinking, uh, even though it's innate to our culture. So I'll give you some examples to cultural enablers and cultural obstacles. At least this is my perspective, my understanding of working in an institute of higher education, engaging with students, engaging with stakeholders, doing community-based learning and things like that, that there are some obstacles to wide set adoption and that's trust. So if you're familiar with the ecosystems within countries like Egypt, there's a lot of mistrust. And this is one of the first barriers to bringing design thinking into that space and making it, um, you know, opening up people's minds and hearts to adopting it. Um, and there's a traditional didactic kind of way of learning and teaching. There's a lot of rote learning and teaching, large classrooms, siloed educational systems, higher education that's extremely um, technical and bringing in something like when you say design thinking is siloed into arts and culture, it's also, I guess this term if you're familiar with, it's a fluffy, it's, 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 not, it's not seen as being akin to getting an engineering degree. Why are you empathizing with the users? We don't even use the word empathize when we deal with, hmm. with um, you know, people that work and we say understand, try and get close, try and see their perspective. But when you say empathize, why, why are you asking me to empathize? Um, so this is um, a challenge that we identify, but also there are a lot of enablers. If you ever, anyone here been to Egypt before? Raise your hand, right, all right. If you ask somebody a question, they will always have an answer, right? Egyptians are storytellers. They're sociable. They're open to sharing their stories um, if they feel they're in a safe space. And this, I think, is a huge part of our culture, right? A revolving around stories, revolving around elders telling stories and, and uh, young people receiving these stories and bringing it and weaving it into their life stories. Uh, we're also generous. So we have a sharing culture. So there's a saying that if, uh, if you go and you, you know, happen to visit you know, a farmer in his home, he will sacrifice his last lamb to feed you and offer you a dinner that is uh, worthy of any guest. So there's always this sense when we go and we visit communities of being welcome and them wanting to share their stories with us. Um, and then finally, we, in this point here in the enablers, out of adversity comes a natural tendency to problem solve. So because there are these daily challenges like getting your children to work, uh, getting you know, clean water into your home, um, getting access to the, uh, the types of jobs that you want, everything, there is a challenge in almost every sector of our society. And we're innately two things. We're funny, so we use humor <laughs> a lot. Egyptians are very funny people. And also, um, we're problem solvers. So you'll see people in their homes who have these contraptions of ways of solving things that are their user, they're their solution to their problems. So it's almost like an internal design thinking process going on um, in their minds. Um, and there are existing social behaviors, I'll give you an example, 
of um, what we call Il Farah or Il Gamaiya, which Al Farah means a wedding or a celebration or something. But they hold these events where everyone comes and they give the host some money, right? And then next month, another person will have a party and they give them some money. And then the next month. But if you run a party, you have to pay back at the next party. And then if you go to the next party. So it's a, um, a social system of microloans. That's part of our culture. And there are actually a few startups now that took that idea and turned it into an application. It's called El Gamaia. And that's how people uh, who we're, we're not a bankable, like our, our communities are afraid of banks like they're afraid of other things. Um, so they would prefer to work within a social construct of lending than to go to a bank and take a loan. They couldn't even get one. And this comes from a social construct that's been around for years. You know, someone will come up and say, you know, do you want to be part of our gamaya? I used to work at a public hospital and all their nurses would come and say, doctor, doctor, uh, 20 pounds a month, part of our gamaya. My daughter's getting married. And they would corral us in, everyone. Um, for this kind of social, this collectivist kind of way of seeing the world. Um, and then finally, I'll just end with, we have a long history in our country of social development projects that come in and they, the, the, the spirit and the ethos and the, you know, the love is there. You know, they really want to do good things, but there's no cultural sustainability, right? Um, I've seen so many projects, some successful, some not so successful. I've been part of projects that on paper look fantastic and you do great work for two or three years and then the granting body is gone and the people have not been empowered enough. Just, they're just enough to know, but not enough to do. And I think this needs to change because our, um, I think our populations, they're young, they're bright, they're smart, they're educated. Um, and this is key to you know, laying the ground in the landscape for something so human and people-centered and life-centric as design thinking. So I'm inviting you all, after sharing you know, a little bit of my story coming from Egypt, and again, the Middle East is different, kind of like Africa, but also there are lots of similarities between us as cultures and the same language and the same family and social traditions um, to create these opportunities for design thinking across all the sectors. I think we're ready and our culture is rich and long and uh, yeah, it's time for us to start doing it for ourselves. That's, what my, that's my wish for this conference. Right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, out of interest in South Africa, we have what's called stock fouls, uh, <laughs> which, which is why all the South Africans in the room were Everybody nodding aggressively nodding, yeah. when we were talking about social system of microloans. And yeah. it actually is a multi-billion rand uh, industry that now formal banking is trying to get They're into trying. and yeah, harnessing same. basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, Mana, you, you are in the teaching space. How do we take this level of diversity? And, and here we're looking at the African continent and the Middle East. And even with neighbors, there's so much diversity. How, how do we bring that into the teaching room uh, when we're teaching design thinking? Sure. Um, before I start, I just want to say that I'm very happy and grateful to be here, but also I'm very sad and worried, but hopeful about what is happening um, in my home country of Iran. So I really want to use this platform to echo the voices of brave um, girls, women, and men who are fighting for their basic human rights. Thank you. Um, to go back to your question, um, I'm originally from Iran. I studied in different parts of the world and really had my fair share of, you know, cultural mismatches in education system because I was socialized differently. And later on when I started actually teaching as well, especially design thinking in different parts of the world, I could see the same look of confusion sometimes in my students' faces. So this topic became very interesting to me and later on I I had the privilege to take this as a PhD thesis. I had the privilege to come here in 2017. Actually, Richard and his team really opened the, uh, the door to me to learn from them and see how they adapt. And also later on in Malaysia, um, the same. To learn really how are educators on the ground adapting the methodology to their own context. And um, I'm not going to bore you with the whole thesis, but maybe some points that might be relevant and answer your question. 
is that I think we have to really acknowledge that design thinking as we know today and how it's often taught um, originated from Stanford University and Silicon Valley, as you also heard. So it's very much rooted in that culture. It is very much influenced by that context and works very well in that context. But we cannot just replicate it somewhere else without any adaptation. And we might need to just be cognizant of that. And just to give you two, three examples to clarify this point, for instance, how design thinking is being taught. We, you know, we focus so much, emphasize on learning by doing, right? We throw people into the experience and then we, you know, um, we reflect on it later. Pretty much problem-based learning or um, experiential learning. And this approach in education has been practiced a lot in many Western countries, especially in university level. Maybe even at high schools, you know, teamwork and project work is something that is done. But that's not the case everywhere else in the world. And I think Hoda also mentioned, still a lot of countries we have rote learning, teacher-centered education. Um, we don't encourage critical thinking and a lot of emphasis is on learning by heart and doing the test. So there is a mismatch and if we suddenly come, and I can tell you firsthand because I was socialized in such a context and suddenly been given so much freedom, it was actually very scary and paralyzing. So we need to revisit our approach in teaching. Sometimes maybe we need to introduce people gradually to this experiential learning if they are not familiar with. So it wouldn't hurt if we introduce some readings in advance or some theory because this is how people were socialized and just something to be mindful of. Or going back to methods and tools that we use in design. They're also a product of their context, right? So they might work very well in their context of origin, but actually not as effective. Design research, we use a lot of open interviews. Maybe in Palo Alto, in a cafe or a bar, you can have a really deep conversation with a stranger and learn a lot of insights. But this might not be something that would be so insightful, in, although people might be super friendly, but maybe in Tehran you cannot do this, or you might need to think about other methods. And there are tons of good work by scholars in this field of cross-cultural research who advocate for alternative methods and also daring to create your own methods, so not going with these popular ones. And finally, maybe I just leave something for um, this round. Um, something that personally has helped me a lot because I think our roles as educators and practitioners in design is very powerful. Um, especially we get to travel around the world and work with different people in different sociocultural contexts. This concept of cultural humility in contrast to cultural competency is something that has definitely helped me a lot because cultural competency implies that you know, I learn about the culture and I, became, and I become an expert. But actually cultural humility is a lifelong process. It involves a lot of self-critic, self-reflection, and really thinking about our positionality, the realities of the social and cultural context we are trying to serve. Yeah, and I don't want to take more time for this round. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will in a moment come back to the question of language because as, as Hoda uh, quite rightly articulated, some of the cultural contexts we find ourselves in don't have words uh, that translate uh, as far as design thinking is concerned. And how do we, how do we go about the process of thinking around that? But, uh, but I'll come back to you uh, in a moment. John, uh, you work all over the world, but we, we're going to look at a, a sort of a, a, pro a perspective from China, if, if, if you will. Um, how, how do you then go about the process of designing across uh, culture and, and share some of your story and your history? Well, it's wonderful, wonderful to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. It's just such a privilege to be within this multicultural environment here. And I'd like to actually share some of the, uh, share off some of the slides. It's not so much about me, but I just want to highlight this uh, and give credit to one of the very talented Chinese um, artists based in Berlin, uh, which kind of showcases actually my two cultures. You know? So I've been growing up in China, but I have also inherited some of the Chinese um, heritage, but no, sorry, grew up in Germany and uh, inherited some of the Chinese, Chinese values. And um, it's 
quite difficult to summarize and to wrap up 5,000 years of history uh, <laughs> within now this, this, this pitch here, but um, I just want to give you an, uh, yeah, a snapshot, a snippet uh, of, of um, the Chinese history. So, um, you know, the 5,000 years old history has a lot of implications actually uh, on spirituality and, and, and philosoph uh, philosophy, right? So, um, if you think about China, it's, we, ha we still have the stigma of made in China products, but I, I feel like deeply rooted, um, it is all about um, yeah, these kind of novelties and um, creative spirits that we have um, kind of developed throughout the, the thousand years of, of history. Um, so um, creativity and innovation basically is, in China is regarded as so-called soft power, right? And uh, that has been reinforced after the 90s um, that um, China really wanted to become a bit more accessible and, and, and to, to open up um, their um, perception of creativity and innovation. Yeah. Um, actually, the, yeah. So this, this image uh, I found on the internet um, kind of represents the, um, I would say the ambiguity yeah, that we are facing at the moment. So um, we have, I think this year, over 10 million graduates in China, yeah, and this is, uh, this is an image from an art school, um, and um, it captures so many facets of how we have to rethink accessibility um, and power allocation um, to this really huge demand of looking for creative, uh, um, I would say creative, um, or new ways of, of, of thinking, yeah, so this is um, one of the um, the, the messages of this image and also um, I feel like um, what you can see here that China is also very uh, dominated by a we culture, right? As you might know, so very collectivistic, uh, coll um, collectivist um, uh, uh, culture and the themes of inclusion and diversity in the Chinese context actually are becoming more relevant now with this new shift of demographics, right, as you can imagine. So, um, yeah, we will have to redefine creativity and innovation from China, yeah, and um, so allocation of power and privilege is something which um, we should keep in mind. Yeah. The next picture um, actually um, was, actually it showcases a very cliche depicted perspective of work in China. You know? As you might see, um, this is a, uh, it is also um, deals with a lot of ambiguity here, yeah, and uh, it needs to be put in a clear context, yeah, that this is not the normal state in China, right? Uh, but I just want to uh, create a little bit of provocation here because um, based on latest research, um, we do realize that there's a, a tendency that, uh, um, that collectivism is, is still very strong, but the, let's say the new generation, yeah, which will grow up with all the uh, technologies and access to digital tools will become definitely um, more anxious now about this whole, this whole uh, legacy, I would say, of, of Chinese history, right? And, and um, what we have also um, seen in, in, in China is that there, yeah, there is a higher level of indulgence. Yeah? People are really actually um, um, put more emphasis on enjoying the life. Yeah? They realize that these kind of images you see is not something that they would like to have in the future, of course not. Yeah? Um, but this is um, definitely also um, one of the uh, hypotheses that I have that design thinking as, as a method to convey fun, enjoyment, you know, some, something like uh, gamification yeah? is definitely something that um, creates um, new solutions also in China. And um, yeah, so the last picture, actually just to conclude it, um, I think this, this um, highlights also very well that there's a demographic advancement and uh, progress yeah, that, will leave, uh, that will lead to a shift of mindset yeah, out of China. And um, this, this picture really shows quite well that, yeah, we are we're the same, yeah? uh, either east or west, yeah? but we are still unique. Yeah, in the way of how we express um, certain issues and challenges. All right, John, thank, thank you. you.
And Lillian, you're going to help us understand the Latin American context where, uh, and perhaps speak to the question of responsibility to the societal environment that you find yourself in. Lovely to have you here. It must be extremely early where you are in Sao Paulo. Good morning. Good morning. My pleasure to joining you from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, where I'm based in. Um, it's early in the morning here, but I have to start my day with you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to add a business perspective uh, to this available discussion here. Yes, um, I'm a head. I, I've been in the technology industry for a long time. Nowadays, I'm a head of innovation and IBM. What I have is a um, unique opportunity to help large companies to rethink their process, their business, to generate a positive impact on the society and the environment. I'm also a design thinking coach, um, running workshops and training people since 2015. And um, I mean, when I start the practice of design thinking here in Latin America, uh, it seems to me, especially for uh, technology projects, it seems to me essential since the corporate managed systems, uh, they are simply ignore the human interactions, how people would feel and interact with with day-to-day -day transactions. Now the game has changed. So to keep competitive, companies must uh, design human centered for solutions and generate positive impact while contribute to the society and the environment as well. So it's a cultural change, cultural change. And uh, in Latin America, uh, we are more open to replicate more and innovate less. So companies are not really open to, to fail fast and learn and, and really find new things. And, but by the other side, uh, in countries uh, where the, uh, the social inequality is big and the government is not able to meet basic needs, I mean, the companies must play a key role to promote the social progress. It's a, it's a must. We must empower people. We must promote a change maker mindset, give them the right tools to design the solutions they need uh, to bring more economic and social prosperity. And this is the, I mean, the, the best contribution a company can make in Latin America nowadays. Some time ago, um, I had the opportunity, I'm gonna share two, two cases, real cases with you, where design thinking, the principles of design thinking, the empathy, the collaboration, the experimentations made all the difference, were essential to make it happen. Some, some time ago, some two years ago or so, I had the opportunity to design a solution for a global company uh, willing to buy from suppliers that contribute to the social progress of the region they operate. It's not an easy task. I mean, how to find them, how to find the surprise, evaluate their contribution and prioritize them. After interviewing several suppliers and buyers, we built a portal. A portal where uh, suppliers were ranked according to some criteria, such as local labor hiring, investment in social programs, investment in education for the people, you know, in the community who lives in the city or where the service was, uh, was needed. Um, we found a way, you know, to, to differentiate suppliers who were really connected to the social progress of the, the region from the others uh, who just want to make money in return to their city. And this is a beautiful case, right, where we, we are not able to, to design without a good methodology and a good approach, a more empathetic approach, not only uh, for the business purpose, but also the society and the environment, the entire ecosystem. And one more case that I'd like to share with you, uh, which is a beautiful case, um, it's the plastic bank. In my opinion, uh, design thinking made all the difference in this, in this case, because its mission is to prevent tons of plastic from ending up in the oceans. 
um, and when they start to investigate the problem, uh, they, they realize that uh, the, the plastic was discarded into the ocean because people didn't value it. Uh, com companies specializing in recycling, in recycling here pay, pay little for plastic, you know, collected by people who need to generate income. And for that reason, collectors look at for cans, for paper, you know, and other recyclable materials. And after investigating the needs and expectations of each actor in these ecosystems involved in these ecosystems and this context, um, what we in design thinking we call the personas, né? the collector, the recycling company, the citizen, it was possible to understand that there's a business opportunity for everyone. So plastic bank, uh, um, when, when a collector nowadays um, collects the, the plastic and sell to some uh, organization associated to the plastic bank, this, these people um, receive a fee, an additional fee from plastic bank uh, to make more money, you know, and, and keep motivated of avoiding um, of letting the, the plastic key go into the ocean. Lillian, thank you very much for sharing those, particularly speaking to um, how business, in whatever context you find yourself in, has to have a, a, a connectedness, you called it, to social progress, which I think is something that uh, we all can resonate with and certainly uh, learn from. Um, I've got another 24 minutes with this panel, which means it's now your time to ask as many questions as you wish. I've got tons more. I can go on for another 24 minutes, but I'd rather they answer your questions. So uh, by show of hands, please, a microphone will be brought to you. Uh, and of course, if you are joining us online, uh, do use the uh, platform to then pose your question, and our moderators will uh, be sharing those questions uh, with us. Um, there's a hand um, there, and there's a hand uh, in the blue here. Thanks so much. This was a really interesting panel. Um, my name is Jess. Sorry, I teach sorry, here. If you don't mind standing up, so that'll sure. be fantastic. Um, Thank you. Thanks. I teach here at the business school, and I, I'm curious about your experiences of having the kind of shifts where people in wealthy countries can come and do design thinking in spaces like this. I mean, Cape Town is destination number one for a lot of this work, uh, but but it's a lot more difficult for us to send our students to California to go and analyze design thinking there. And I'm, I'm sure this is something everybody in this room has grappled with a bit. So in your respective organizations, how do you manage that inequity and how do you uh, prepare your students, uh, think with the limitations of the methodology, adjust it, and then particularly work with visiting academics from, or, or scholars or design thinkers from wealthy countries who have the methodology but don't always have the cu cultural nuance? Thank you. Uh, with your permission, I'm going to pose that question to Hoda and to Mana because they're both in teaching institutions, mm -hmm. uh, just so that we can go through more questions within the period of time, please. Uh, Mana, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, thanks for that question. I think it's very, very important. I want to also invite you to not only look at the countries specifically, also within the same country. Who gets to go to different communities, especially marginalized communities, and design for them? So this really touches on um, recent critiques on how we are practicing design, because we are still um, we are still putting the design team and the designer in a more privileged position. We get to go, get inspired by people, come back, work with that data, develop that knowledge decide what frame and what nugget we want to look at and then you know of course ideate prototype go back again and test it so people who should be experts on this are left out completely from the process and um, whereas i think if we move from you know designing for people to designing with them really making sure that actually those people are part of the design team. They are in the room, they are in, even when, they, when we are defining the project. In many times, as you said, the project is defined and now we need experts like, 
let's bring them from this you know, famous institute instead of looking around us and see how we can make those changes really sustainable. Because if we continue this, and usually also design and design thinking is placed within university. In many countries, very exclusionary space. Not everyone has con you know, access to it. Whereas those communities who need design thinking are actually don't have access to it. And if we continue like this, we're going to just perpetuate this cycle of having experts coming in, solve your problem, leave. So it, it, I, I wish I had uh, an answer, um, but I'm happy that you raised that question. And I just want to also use this space because I'm sure like everyone is like either practicing or teaching. I think we need to just bring these conversation about power and privilege and who gets to go where and do what um, more um, into our practice. All right, so I'm going to address the second part of your question, which is how do you prepare students when you send them into a space that they may not be prepared for? We, we work with what we call um, USAID scholars, programs at our university, and we get hundreds of students. We have a, a, a AUC, American University in Cairo, lead program. We have a long history of bringing students who are academically very strong. Um, from across the country and across the Middle East to our university and sending them right, to learn new things and to experience other cultures and to build themselves as global citizens and all of this. But we don't throw them into the deep end, right? You, you can't expect students who are still learning uh, to have all the skills that are required of them to um, feel as equals in the space they move into. So, for example, we'll uh, give them um, a few days, almost like a boot camp, we'll give them an intro. What is design thinking? We'll talk to them about entrepreneurship. We'll talk to them about academic integrity and how to carry them. So we'll talk to them about um, public speaking. Uh, we'll talk to them about the culture that they're going into so that they feel, it's almost like creative confidence in a sense, but they feel more confident and they go into that learning space as equals. So they're not going in as, you know, these exchange students that are coming into a space to learn and leave, they're coming in to also add value. Uh, we do a lot of intercultural dialogue courses, intercultural uh, cross-collaboration projects, uh, virtually and in person. But the key here is just to set expectations and to prepare the students and identify what is it that they need the most and listen to them and ask them, what do you need the most to make you succeed, right? You never want to set up students to fail. You always want to make sure they have all the tools they need as much as you can to succeed in whatever space you send them into. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the gentleman with the... Our, our next question is going to come from our online platform, right. so, so thank so, you very sorry. much. We'll mm -hmm. take that question now, if you don't okay. mind going to the gentleman in the meantime, while yeah. you read your question. Collapse. You can read your I'll question read for one? the panel. Yeah. Okay, so from yeah. online, um, for Huda Mustafa, thanks so much for the comments. Elders are storytellers who carry cultural traditions. How does one embrace these valuable memories while breaking free from patriarchy to allow other voices to be heard, like the youth, women, the poor, LGBTQIA+, etc.? All right. So this, this tradition, you know, Egyptian society is, is patriarchal in a sense, where we have this tradition of whether it's in the mosque or whether it's in the older schools, you know, Al-Azhar University is one of the oldest universities uh, across the globe, but there's that one person who's giving the knowledge, right? It's that one person who has all the knowledge and the stories and well, the memories of that region or that, that area. Um, but more and more I'm finding that um, because education is seen as uh, a form of social mobility, a, social, a form of social empowerment, education is free. Um, I have my re reservations about the quality of that free education because free doesn't always mean high quality. However, if you want an education, you can get it. More and more girls are getting into schools and staying in schools. More and more women are going into university. The majority of our uh, government workforce are women. Um, we have very generous, for example, we have one of the most generous um, maternity leave policies, paid maternity leave policies in the world, but that doesn't mean that our women, uh, that there's gender equity or that our women are empowered. It means that we're getting there, right? Um, 
when I was younger, there was very few women in the public space, very few women in corporate jobs, very few women, they were school teachers maybe. That's how I would see women. So I think um, education is key and creating opportunities. So um, finding a space where you can make it easier for women to do their jobs. At my center, for example, a lot of the people that work there have young children. Just a very simple example. We have flexible working hours. You can't expect a woman um, to come in and contribute to society when she has to be home for her children at 3 p.m. But she can put in a few hours in the evening to make up. So this is flexibility and this openness. I think it's changing in Middle Eastern societies. Uh, in the last 10 years, there have been huge changes. And I think it's because, or I know it's because of education and that it just has to change. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. Thank you very much. Uh, your question? There's a microphone to your... Um, thank you so much. Um, from the African context, my takeaway was that um, um, design has always existed in Africa. So I'd like to ask that um, in a generation that is losing touch with their, cult with their cultural um, origins, how can we innovate while remaining um, rooted in our cultural identity? Felix, I think that's, that yeah. one is right. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, as I said in my introduction, we're taking some of the things that they've been doing, you know, um, and then let me use design thinking. So we take somebody like uh, uh, this blacksmith who is, you know, um, coming up with a tool, and we use that as an analogy for the person or the people to understand design thinking. So more or less, we're using what we've been doing already, but we're drawing the attention to it that what you've been doing is some kind of a design process that we're working on. But it has been reformed, and this is how we go about it. Like I said with the other one too, that he talked about the dating and those things. He used the, what they call the, the processes for design thinking, but he saw where he took it from for the students to understand. So that's what we're doing. We're using our everyday example things for us to understand things that we lost and then bring them together again. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you have another online question? Yes, yes, please. So one thing that comes to mind with this is sometimes the fear to make design thinking your own at times, really applying the mindsets to how you are actually working within your context and system. Therefore, let's seek the expert. I'm curious, how do you create an environment that fosters this redefinition of concepts with the communities rather than around the communities? And it doesn't direct that question to any particular. John, I'll give it to you. That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about it. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm focused very much um, on culture and workplace. Yeah? Just maybe to, to give an example here of how we want to create an exclusive, uh, inclusive um, workplace also to, to consider how we're going to um, involve all the stakeholders, right? It might be society, it might be internal colleagues, right? So every one of us would like to have a proper organizational culture, right? And for me, the, the challenge here is really to how do I provide culture as an equity, right? How can I make culture accessible uh, for, let's say, for people who do not have this kind of sense of belonging. Yeah? And I think um, this is for me definitely one of the challenges that we are facing at the moment um, if we talk about organizational uh, or if we are in this um, organizational context. Yeah? So, um, yeah, access to culture and how do we um, actually promote the values and qualities of design thinking in this um, is also very crucial. Yeah? And um, which again leads to my conclusion to say that everyone is talking about ESG at the moment, right? So environmental, social and governance. But I feel like culture is so, um, so important, such an important aspect uh, in the S and in the G, right? But because a lot of focus is on the, uh, is on the environmental um, aspects. But if we need to, uh, to look at culture and how to reinforce culture in organizations, we definitely need to check and see and review, elaborate on um, the, the, the governance part of it you know, to make it as inclusive as we can. Yeah. For sure. Uh, Lillian, I, I'll come to you two, two questions now. Lillian, I'm going to ask each of the panel members actually the following question, but I'm going to go with you first. 
we have to accept that we live in a world of inequity, right? There's power and privilege, yes, yes. a comment that had been referenced a little bit earlier. Uh, the practitioners and teachers of design thinking uh, surely have an ethical responsibility to prioritize inclusion as well as social justice uh, in, in what we teach, in what we practice, in what, we, uh, in what processes we follow in the uh, design process or design thinking process. The question I have for you and for each of you panel members, how do we do this? <laughs> it's um, uh, a good question and, um, and something that makes me reflect a lot. Um, I think that um, we, we talk about to design thinking, um, uh, most people uh, talk about design thinking as a methodology, as a tool, but more than that, I think that design thinking is really a mindset, a mindset where we are able to bring people together and give them voice and room to share their ideas and to make, and make changes. Um, build solutions, uh, test solutions, try new new things, and 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 this is what I've been seeing, especially in, in large companies and very hierarch hierarchical um, organizations, where when we are starting running workshops and bringing people together, it doesn't matter if in in which role you are, you know, if you are a president or a simple analyst, you know. Um, intern, um, you have your voice and you have your room to share your ideas and, and, and try new things. Um, and this is something that we as citizens, uh, we, we must uh, uh, provide, we must find uh, places uh, where we are able to foster this mindset, you know. And as long as we start doing by this uh, in our companies, in, in, in our schools, within our society, we are able to, to change completely uh, the way we, we see power and privilege nowadays. Thanks for that, Lydia. Uh, Hoda? Um, I'm going to speak from my experience, which is teaching and learning. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with community-based learning, but this is, a, this is a, a pedagogy, right? It's a, it's a teaching strategy, teaching and learning strategy. And over the last few years, we've been considering the, the actual community-based learning, which is student-centered, right? Even though uh, the caveat is that there must be a win-win. The community brings their problem and their needs. The students and the teacher work with the community. They provide solutions and they learn along the way. They learn about team building. They learn about uh, empathy. They learn about interviewing, qualitative research, quantitative. They learn all these things and then they leave, right? What does the community do with the solution? If, they have, if, if they've participated in identifying the problem, if they've participated in reframing the problem and solving the problem and contributing to the ideas, their needs, and then the students are gone or the NGO is gone. Or, so how do we, that's a conundrum, right? How do, how do we solve that? And um, I don't have an answer, but I think that um, embedding um, design thinking into a community and there is one use case in Egypt that is highly successful and it's the um, Seacom farm of 13 villages and they embedded a school, they embedded a clinic, they embedded a nursery, they embedded a university into this 13 village uh, rural area in Egypt and uh, they placed themselves in the heart of the community and it became part of the community. Um, I don't know if this is scalable or feasible, but it became just part of the way they do things, right? The way they solve problems, they reach out to the different centers and, and embedded, like in, in, in academia we have an embedded librarian or an, an embedded that comes into the classroom and contributes to the learning and then leaves, right? So why should they leave? Why don't they stay? So this is just something that I've been thinking about lately. How do you embed this into the communities instead of having, you know, this beautiful school and, and coming to us, how do we go to them? And this is something I'm just questioning right now. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Felix? Right. I'm, I'm going to tackle from a personal point of view, you know, um, when I was doing the course I, I talked about uh, the raw art industry, 
I majored in textiles and then um, woodwork. Along the line, I realized that the loom that we're using was more geared towards people who are able. I might use some words, please pardon me if I use those words, yeah. So I thought about those who, you know, uh, are not able, but they are interested in, you know, um, waving, kente, you know, the, the famous kente. So I went to the village, started talking with the people over there. Initially, the reception wasn't good. I mean, they thought these people cannot really be of um, use to the society, but I had to take time to tell them that, look, they are interested as well, but just that you've not catered for them. So how do you go about it? It took some time for them to understand and for them to open up and to give me information for me to come up with this product for them as well. Sometimes, I think you, we, we have to go a bit further, right? It will take some time for us to get to them. But you have to have patience. Let them understand and appreciate the need of what you want to do before you push on. Um, as a student, when I was going, to, be, to tell you the truth, I was a bit scared as well too. That what's the reception going to be like? Am I going to recede? Or the people are going to throw me? Even before that, I was going there, I was going to that village, but talking from another point of view. So for me, yeah, um, how do you get there there? Somehow, you can't prepare a student, you can't prepare anybody to a point before you go. Sometimes you may have to go there and then learn for me, face it, and then as a designer, we know what to do best and yeah. handle it from there. Yeah. Thank you. Manu? Um, I think design thinking is a very powerful approach um, in tackling the social um, complex problems that we have. But um, I think what we are missing right now is really discussions about power and privilege mm -hmm. early on in the process. What is our lived experiences? Are we the right people to tackle this challenge? And I think if we don't have those conversations, and they might sound hard, but we need to face them and we need to teach them because we're teaching this powerful tool to students and not necessarily giving their responsibility that they should also have all the time. So I think that is something um, we focus also a lot on disciplinary diversity, but the lived experiences of people is as important as their learned experiences, especially when it comes to social justice issues. Um, and finally, uh, going back to that really good question that was raised, I think all of us as individuals, also institutes, it would be really good to reflect whenever a project is coming to us, why is this project coming to me? Is there a better institute, a better suited institute or a better suited person that I know that has a closer lived experience? Um, to work together, especially right now in Global South, there's just so much synergy, you know, we can learn so much from each other that I think this also reflection would be a good starting point as well. John? Yeah, for, for me, um, having the privilege to be, let's say, exposed to design thinking is, is a huge asset. Uh, for us being here now, sitting in this D school, having access to all the tools, um, being able to learn, to have an open mindset is, is just amazing. Looking back from a local or from a cultural perspective of, of China, probably this is, I don't want to get too political here, but as you know, the, the, the values um, are probably a little bit shifted. Yeah? So that's why um, it depends on, I would say, on the maturity level. Yeah? of how, how are you, or how the system is being managed and being run in order to implement uh, design thinking. Yeah? And um, it it's really comes back to the values and qualities of design thinking, right? To say, okay, yes, we would like to collaborate, we want to have this open mindset, we want to be creative, we want to be uh, open-minded and accessible. Right? So it's, it's a powerful tool, um, but we have to look very specifically at the local conditions and the local context. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for indulging me with those uh, two questions. I've got two minutes left, so I might only have time for one question. There, were, there was a, in the orange, please. And if you can direct your question to um, a panelist, please. So my question is, how do you advocate for design thinking solutions when the decision-making to effect change is not in your control? 
Who would you like to answer that question? Um, anyone? Hold on, I'll give it oh, to you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you advocate for a design thinking solution or approach? Um, when you don't have the yeah, decision-making power. when you don't have power. the decision-making power. I have some experience with that. <laughs> um, I took a design leadership uh, course over a year um, with designers from all over the world. And every single person I was with in a breakout room had the same challenge. How do you articulate the value of something to someone who hasn't experienced it before, right? So I think for me, uh, invite people to try it, right? My experience has been that everyone who's been, has tried design, whether it's a 75 minute, you know, um, redesign, you know, redesign the wallet kind of thing you're familiar with at Stanford, or whether it's a, a, a design sprint, that's one way of doing it. Uh, another way is return on investment, right? If you can articulate and find, um, I think Richard talked about the price of design or the cost of design and the, the, um, the threat of bad design, right? If you can find a way to articulate that to whoever you're talking to, who has the power to make the decision, but sometimes you don't get a seat at that table, right? Sometimes you can't reach these people to articulate the value of what you believe in. Um, so if you can't reach those people, I think sharing success stories, right? Whether it's through social media or whether it's through your university's webpage or whether it's through any kind of communication challenge, these small successes, they build up over time and you can get people talking and learning about what you're doing. And then someday someone's gonna say, oh, what's happening in you know, that area? What is design thinking? What are they doing? And they'll come maybe and ask you. So there are, I think everyone talked today about their you know, serendipity, that luck. And there were five stories here about they just collided with design thinking. Sometimes that will happen in my experience. So keep trying. <laughs> All right. Round of applause, please, for my panel. And Lillian, once again, thank you for, I mean, I, it's what, minus seven, right? To Sao Paulo or something uh, like that, which means uh, it's 5.44 in the morning where she is. So we really, we really appreciate uh, your, your, your waking up. And during so the lunch nice. break, <laughs> thanks Lillian. During the lunch break, we certainly invite you to please continue engaging. The panelists are here. We've only just scratch the surface of this conversation.